panelimiz bu seneki temamızın e, ufak bir özeti gibi olacak. Bu bakış açılarına sahip konuşmacılarımız yerel ve küresel ekonomilerde itici güç tasarım panelimize e, yön verecekler ve yine e, ilham verici konuşmalarla sahnemizi dolduracaklar. Panelin moderatörü Yaşar Üniversitesi'nde akademisyen ve 4T Tasarım ve Tasarım Tarihi Topluluğu Başkanı Sayın Tevfik Balcıoğlu. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş geldiniz efendim. Buyurunuz lütfen. Doğa ve zanaatı buluşturan, doğa dostu tasarımlar yapan Rizom Tasarım Stüdyosu kurucusu ve baş tasarımcısı Rebecca Ruben. Ah. Rebecca. <gülüyor> Hello, how are you? <gülüyor> ve son olarak Nairobi Üniversitesi'nden akademisyen ve aynı zamanda Afrika Endüstriyel Tasarımcılar Derneği Başkanı Lilak Osanyo bizlerle beraber olacak. Ah, Lilak Osanyo da geliyor. Thank you very much. Ve değerli hocamıza sözü bırakıyoruz. Kendisi... Yaşar Üniversitesi akademisyen, aynı zamanda tasarım ve tasarım tarihi topluluğu başkanı. Söz sizde hocam. Teşekkür, teşekkür ediyoruz. Teşekkür ederim. Ben teşekkür ederim. Ee, sorunun boşalmasını bekliyorum. Yavaş yavaş e, sandalyeler boşalmakta ve ben de boş bir sahneye, daha su dolu bir sahne ve boş bir salona konuşma heyecanı içinde olacağım. Evet. Efendim hoş geldiniz bizim yönettiğimiz bu bölüme. Müsaadenizle ben şimdi İngilizce olarak devam edeceğim. Çünkü konuşmalarımız, konuşmacılarımız yabancı. Onlarla doğrudan iletişim kurmak açısından bu işi İngilizce yürütmenin doğru olduğunu düşünüyorum. Ama ben bir sözle başlamak istiyorum. Today is a very meaningful day for us. As you know, Uh, we are commemorating the, uh, the, our uh, Leaders Day, uh, the 10th of uh, November. And years ago, uh, he said something, it's on the screen at the moment. He said, the power which dominates the life and activities of human beings is the creative invention uh, of skills. So this is, I think, a very, very uh, meaningful statement by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Uh, and although in those years the word design did not exist, he uh, emphasized the importance of inventions, creativity, and innovation. So actually, he was talking about design. Now this is the subject of our uh, panel meeting today. Uh, we will be looking at the power of design from global and uh, local economies point of view. Well, we are lucky, we are lucky because we have two excellent uh, speakers. And maybe the first time we will be looking at the East and the South. What I mean uh, with the sentence is that normally Turkish design and designers are accustomed to look at the West. What's happening in Italy, what's happening in Germany, what's happening in America, but what's happening in the East? What's happening in India? What's happening in Kenya? Do we know anything about that? No, we don't. So today, uh, actually with this excellent two speakers, we will be uh, touching upon these issues. The different dimensions of global and uh, local economies from the point, uh, point of view of uh, design. Right, uh, after saying that, our, uh, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca uh, Rubens. She's from India. Uh, she is running her own uh, office, Rizom, uh, and he, she has been in uh, Holland, uh, and she has excellent connections with uh, Europe, but also working very hard uh, in her country and creating uh, sustainable uh, designs. Therefore, I would like to give uh, the microphone uh, to uh, Rebecca and uh, want to listen to her presentation first, uh, and then we will follow, uh, listen to uh, Lila. Uh, then we will discuss. That's the uh, layout. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, I hope you can understand my English. I'm going to try to speak a little slower because I speak quite fast. 
So I was also a juror for the Turkish uh, Industrial Design Week and uh, um, the world is looking more and more at uh, the paradigm of industrial design and looking at new aspects to um, refresh it. So I'm going to talk about how you could draw on craft and sustainability, both which are very much in the forefront around the world for industrial design. Why doesn't it move? Okay. Um, I started out as an industrial designer from the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad in India. And my first project was actually uh, doing a collection of uh, bamboo products with underprivileged communities. Being from a city myself, I had never actually seen um, poverty up close. And uh, when I actually went to the village and I saw that uh, the producers were actually uh, so poor that they didn't get three meals a day, that they didn't have electricity, it was shocking for me seeing it. And that made the shift for me for design to look at design for development. It was very interesting and I realized many years ago that the whole idea of industrial design is to look at a nation's development, to help you develop, to help you move from developing to a developed country. But when we look at development in the industrial framework, we only look at large industries. The truth is that real development cannot happen unless we look at the underprivileged sections of our country. Following that, I worked with a lot of governments, I worked with a lot of um, multi-governmental institutions, um, NGOs, enterprises, and um, the material I worked with was bamboo. Now at that time, all of these institutions looked at bamboo because um, it was easy to process. Uh, wood has circular fibers. So whenever you cut a log of wood, you see those circular fibers. So if you want to cut wood, you need a sawmill. But if you want to cut bamboo, because it has vertical fibers, you just tear it and it tears straight through. So you just need a small tool to make a notch in it. It's really easily available, except for um, Antarctica, I think it grows everywhere. Um, it's inclusive because it's light. It's basically a tube that functions like a rod because it has cross connections. And there are a lot of craft groups who work with bamboo. Now on the other hand, the whole rest of the world was not looking at bamboo for its social aspects, it was looking at bamboo for its ecological aspects, for green design, because it's really renewable. So if you cut a tree, the tree is gone forever, but bamboo is a grass. So if you cut year one bamboo, then you will still have year two bamboo, and if you cut year two bamboo, you will still have year three bamboo. So you never actually lose green cover. Bamboo absorbs a lot of nitrogen, so it's really good for water pollution. It has a network that provides uh, against soil erosion, and its leaves fall and contain moisture. So it's really good for degraded lands. So at that time, in um, say around 2010 or so, there was this huge explosion of innovation with bamboo products. Um, some of my colleagues in Delft University had a workshop, and they developed a chair like that. Uh, at the same time, Asus developed the first laptop casing, which was a huge thing because here was a non-industrial material like bamboo, which had been stabilized to the extent that it could be used with electronics. So it was a giant leap for everybody working with bamboo. And this trickled down to all of the mass production firms in China and all of the industrial principles we know, uh, the natural colors and the bright palette, stackability, modularity, all of those things started getting applied to bamboo. But as I saw it, there was a huge gap between uh, what my communities were doing and what the market wanted. So if you look at the material bamboo, on one hand were the really expensive and really beautiful designs I had to admit that people wanted. But on the other hand were the really exquisite crafted products that nobody wanted, not even the communities. Uh, who they were crafted for because they were used for agriculture and plastic had come in. And so craft had become cheap. It had become a mass production, sticky, jammy thing that you get in exhibitions which nobody wanted to buy and designers didn't want to touch. 
So what I observed was that in the traditional value chain, okay, the guy grows the bamboo in his backyard, he cuts it using his knife, he carries it on his head, he designs it and innovates it, and he sells it to his neighbor. So every bit of money the guy has to make, the craftsperson makes. But we look at this value chain. The growing is done by somebody who has a plantation. It's definitely not the guy, but let's assume there's some way for the guy to tie into the plantation. The harvesting is done by the guy who has a mechanical machine. The transporting is done by the guy who has a van. The innovation money comes to me. The processing money goes to whoever has the factory. And the marketing money goes to the shop. So it was really important for me to work on the strategy to look at bamboo as a vehicle for holistic sustainability. Not just look at it as an eco-friendly, commercially viable material because that is not sustainability in the context of my world. So I started as a designer to look at the gap as an opportunity. Um, an exciting opportunity that arose at the same time and came into the forefront was sustainability. Um, at that time, the Harvard Business Review put out an article which says sustainability is the next mega trend. It is going to change the way business happens. And this was true because there were globalized workforces and supply chains, so nobody could monitor what was happening anywhere anymore. There was an intensified competition for natural resources, and you had to pay for things that you never paid for before. You paid for water, you paid for carbon credits, you paid for air miles. Consumers wanted sustainable products. Governments were putting in legislation. There was a whole recall of lead toys from China because of the EU regulations. And there was an explosion of innovation. Everyone was on board. Consumers because it was personal. Companies because it was affecting the way they did business. People weren't accepting unsustainable products anymore. Investors, banks, and economies stopped funding these SMEs and these businesses. Uh, politicians were reacting, I mean, the whole Obama campaign was run on sustainability. Government started cracking down regulatory frameworks and the internet was very much there to cover the entire thing so that nobody got away. The scope of sustainability itself expanded. So around the 70s, the whole idea of sustainability was ecological. Uh, around the 80s, they came up with the idea of sustainable development and said, like, you can't have uh, an eco-friendly thing if people don't make money. So they said, hey, let's put this in perspective. For profit, you need people, and people need the planet to live. So it was just putting the aspects in perspective. And recently, there has been a whole shift to include culture into the whole sustainability paradigm. So instead of looking at the triple bottom line, that is people, profit, and planet, people also look at culture these days. So it was an opportunity for me as a designer Products that were made like this, but look like that, fed into that market share. So we came up with a strategy that was crafted products made from bamboo, produced by communities, and in line with culturally, with commercially viable markets. None of our products were handicraft. Our products were crafted. So we hope to realize more money from the fact that they were not industrially mass-produced cookie cutter products. We also were very mindful that when you design a product, you design a production to consumption system. For example, if you design a coffee machine with a metal cup, you make a decision that metal will be mined. If you do it with a paper cup, you make a decision that paper will be used so trees will be cut. So whether as designers we want to or do not want to own up to these repercussions, the fact remains that designers orchestrate these production to consumption systems. So it was a burning question for me. I left my job in the development sector because I wanted to know, can sustainability actually be sustainable through design? Because this is what I had been preaching, and I wanted to have more skin in the game. So I started my PhD. I established my design firm, and I identified a community. This community was a very poor community in India. You can see the kind of baskets they make at the back, uh, who had no takers for the baskets anymore. There was an NGO who was working with the community and trying to upgrade their skills, but the products were not selling. The first thing as a designer I went in and did was just minimize the material. 
So I took off the material used in the seat, took off the material used in the backrest, and just did it with membrane. Uh, I used a species of bamboo, which is solid, so I could turn it on the lathe. If I could turn it on the lathe, that means as per the industrial norms, I can make it stackable, folding, modular, because it's perfect. Um, bamboo is not a cylinder, it's actually a cone, a very long cone. So with a cone, even if I cut the same bamboo pole in different places, I can't have four legs of the same size. Turning allowed me to get that kind of precision. Um, as you can see, the bamboo is really scarred and not as pretty as uh, bamboo in, say, China and Japan. So I stained the bamboo black to cover up those inadequacies. And I tied up with uh, a denim factory for their denim waste and roped in CSR funding to do the entire backrest and uh, seat. What I did through this is I used less material, I made a standardized product, I reduced transportation costs, and this product could be sold at around nine times the cost of that product and cost half of that product to manufacture. So this product actually did very well. Uh, based on this, we started uh, creating a lot of designs in bamboo which were based on creating modules which could be replicated, so a lot of paneling, a lot of surfaces. Um, we decided that every time we trained a community, the outputs would be used for design. So you can see the back screen, there are circles. We were teaching the community to use the cross cutter. So we joined all of the circles and made a screen. Um, slowly we expanded into other materials as well, like glass and bamboo fiber. So that's my studio. And all of the communities still produced by hand, but our division of craft and industrial was very permeable. We looked at uh, using the human being not as a means of drudgery. So if a machine lightened his work, he should use it. If a machine took his work, he should not use it. It was that simple for us. We wrote a book about it, I wrote a book about it, and actually, um, surprisingly, the most attention the book got was in Belgium where it was released not so much in the developed world where I thought it had the most relevance. Um, I continue sharing the learning with educators in the different institutions in India. And we work on it on a collaborative innovation model because, you know, in the industrial design books, you find facts about plastic and stainless steel and how much they can move and how much you can bend them, but there's no information on traditional materials. So in this sense, the craftsperson becomes the barefoot technician and engineer to the design team. So these are all designer craftspeople team where they are working together. We also share the learning with a lot of technical institutions. So this is not just restricted to the bamboo sector. We worked in Vietnam where we worked with all of the handicrafts. Then we worked with the fisheries sector. Then we worked with various other sectors. So it is actually relevant to all small and medium enterprises. So here we are talking to um, the owners of small and medium enterprises and explaining to them why sustainability works for them. And why sustainability works for them is not because sustainability is going to save the world. It's because if I design an inbuilt handle, it's nice design to me, it's less material from the sustainability perspective, but from the SME perspective, it just simply saves material and so makes them more money. So sustainability needs to be really commercially viable to actually be sustainable. Um, this is sharing the learning with the entire production to consumption system. So uh, my system became the Unido system. It was adopted by Unido. And we actually created a system, a software and a label for assessing and branding sustainability in the bamboo sector. So if you look at the first image, it's totally unsustainable. If you look at the last, it's totally sustainable. But sometimes something may be ecologically sustainable and culturally unsustainable. Um, like a paper product. Sometimes something might be culturally sustainable and ecologically unsustainable, like a wooden product made from a wooden craft. Um, so the way ahead was telling the story, and surprisingly, we never got covered by any of these development magazines, even though we were working in the development sector. We got covered by L Decors and Architectural Digest and really mainstream magazines. So nowhere uh, in our story did the poor people figure it was not like please buy our stuff to help people. It was buy our products because they're awesome design. 
At some point, it became not just about telling the story, but about selling the story because we had been doing a lot of experiments and we needed to break even. So we sent our stuff, our products, to an online website and when they marked up, because we knew nothing about pricing, the next day I was like, oh my God, nobody is going to buy these products and tomorrow morning we have to pay and arrange money for the truck to bring all of this stuff back. But we were pleasantly surprised because these guys actually told the story and sold the story. And the story was that I was one of the few Indian designers who'd been invited to exhibit at the Victorian Albert Museum. So that was the story they told and that was the story that sold. And the next morning we woke up and everything was sold up and it was very surprising and we were all very excited. So from there on, we never told the story of sustainability. We never told the story of the craftspeople. We just told the story of amazing design. So we would say an exclusive collection of handcrafted contemporary designer bamboo furniture and accessories. And this is the story we tell even today. Um, we do a lot of other products. So this is an interior product where we refurbished all of the furniture by laminating it with paper and non-toxic glues. Um, I went back to where I started my diploma project long, long ago. And this time, I came up with a group who could only make this fishing basket. And we had to make spa accessories. So every product that I made was a cross-section of that fishing basket. And the only glass we could get in was the chai cups, the tea cups, which go all over India. So everything was in the tea cups, whether it was a face pack or whether it was a candle. Uh, we designed a lot of flat pack things so it could come out of uh, the mountainous area. Uh, we designed a lot of packaging and this was instantly bought up by a lot of hotels. So my conclusion was there is light at the end of the tunnel and holistic sustainability can be achieved through design in the bamboo sector. Um, but the lesson here, which would be an interesting takeaway in this scenario, is that this is the age of globalization. Everything is moving around. There are no national boundaries or uh, national concepts anymore. With the internet, we are all becoming one world. Production to consumption systems are shifting to developed countries, uh, from develop, developed countries to developing countries. And the reason is that if you shift to a developing country, you have better production opportunities because labor is cheap and material is abundant. And also, they have the most emerging markets. Here we are all talking of export, but Look, Turkey is one of the top 10 emerging markets by 2017. And everybody is going to come to Turkey because Turkey treads the fine line between developed and developing. It still has labor, it still has skills, it still has materials, and it's a growing market. And Turkey is going to look outwards while everybody comes in. So it's really important in this stage of development to look at innovation because when countries normally develop, the first thing they do is Look at what do we have to sell, our raw materials. So they sell their raw materials. Then they say, hey, why are we selling the raw materials? We can actually make this stuff ourselves and make more money. So they get into manufacturing, which is where all countries in transition are. But in the end, it is the one who calls the shots, who makes the design, who does the innovation, that takes the bulk of the value of any product. And that is why innovation is imperative for development. So there are two directions, and all of us should think of what direction are we going to take. Is it industrial? But we know it's not working for them. That's why they're all talking about sustainability. Or is it craft? Is there something sustainable about craft, which is why we all go back? Is there a culture? Is there an identity? Is there something we can draw on? So, so many things of craft dovetail with sustainability. If you look at all the top part, it's frugality, cradle to cradle, indigenous, bioregional. These are all things that are craft terms, but are actually sustainability terms as well. So craft leverages the developing countries, material, labor force, and with you as design, it could actually be the game changer. So already in place are renewable materials, labor, and markets. So all you need is innovation. And culture can be a USP. So this is a traditional bird basket in Vietnam. All we did is we skewed the axes and we came up with an innovative lamp. In the developed world, they had a whole cycle that we didn't have. First they had craft, 
then they had industrialization, then they had a lot of movements. They had Bauhaus, they had modernism, they had postmodernism, and then they finally came to sustainability design. In our context, we actually have a strong craft tradition in India, and I've heard also in Turkey. I think the best thing would be if we could leapfrog all of those mistakes and go directly to sustainability design. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. It was very inspirational. I'm sure we will have some time to discuss in detail. There is no... No? No sound? No? Yes? Yes? Okay. No? Yes. Okay. So I just thanked her, and I expressed my feeling that it was very inspirational, and we will have lots of questions later on to discuss the matter. Our uh, second uh, speaker today is uh, Laila Kosanjo. Uh, she's from uh, Kenya. Uh, she did uh, her uh, BA and PhD at University of Nairobi, uh, and um, at the moment uh, she is the director of School of Arts and Design. Uh, but uh, she has other heads. Uh, she is one of the uh, founders of uh, African Design Network, and also uh, the founder of uh, uh, Kenya Design Society. Uh, in that sense, I'm very uh, pleased actually uh, to welcome her. Uh, and I'm very curious to listen to her presentation. The stage is yours. Thank you, Laila. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm Laila, as you have been told, the director of the School of the Arts and Design at the University of Nairobi. University of Nairobi is uh, a government-owned public university, the biggest in Kenya, and probably the biggest in East Africa. So I'm going to talk about textiles and products that interface between textiles and wood using Okay, now I need to go back. Um, using three, three of my colleagues from from Kenya and Uganda. My school, the School of the Arts and Design, was established like in 1970s. We have about 500 students. We have four degree programs, Bachelor of Arts in Design, Bachelor of Interior Design, Master of Arts, and PhD. The Bachelor of Arts in Design is the oldest of the, of the degree programs. And from after two foundation years, the students are requested to, to select one of the specializations, which is fashion and textiles, graphic design, interior design, product design, and illustration. So every year we have about, about 60 graduates from the program. Bachelor of Interior Design has got about 11, not, not so many yet. And then we have about 10 masters per year, and about two or three PhDs. I, I want to talk about three African designers. Beatrice Mwasi, who is a graduate of the School of the Arts and Design. Kimathi of Jamuri Ware Limited, who plies his trade between New York City and Nairobi. And Sarah Nakizanzi, who is a lecturer, presently a lecturer at the Makerere University in Uganda. So, Beatrice Mwasi has a Sanabora Design House Limited, and she makes traveling bags. The interesting thing about African design is that it's, it's, it's about pattern and material. And once you see some patterns on certain fabric, certain upholstery, certain interiors, you can identify African design if you, if you pay a little attention to it. So Beatrice has, has um, taken the patterns from the, typically from the Ghanaian communities and is making a lot of leather work from the products. We have a lot of leather in Kenya, leather from cattle, sheep, crocodiles, ostrich, and fish leather, among others. So there's, there are enterprises who specialize in making products from those raw materials that are, that are easily available in Kenya. Kimathi of Buyu Safari Duffel Bags 
plies his trade, as I said, between New York City and Kenya. And he makes these duffel bags from um, bamboo, the bamboo, bamboo, bamboo tree, the baobab tree, sorry. Now, baobab tree grows in the driest parts of Kenya. And it, it contains a lot of water. So during the dry season, the elephants will knock off the branches and then the rest of the, of the people and the animals can feed on the water which is stored inside it. And the fruits of the bamboo are actually sold in the marketplace and you can buy them and eat them. So it's, it's also a fruit tree, the baobab tree. And the, the women in, the, in these dry parts of um, Kenya, they strip the bark of the baobab tree and make strips and make fiber from them. And they weave this fiber. That, that fiber is wo woven into the Buyu duffel bags. What, what he's calling Buyu, the brand Buyu, Buyu is actually the name of the fruit that comes out of the baobab tree. So the, brand, the name of the brand is also associated with the Kenyan um, landscape. And his selling point in these Buyu bags is that no one bag is the same as another one. So they are, when, when you buy one, the pattern on it cannot be the same as any other one because they are made by women. These women work these bags at different times using different types of fiber. They dye them different colors. So no two bags can come out the same, but they are, they are standardized in some form, in the shape and everything. Sarah, Sarah Nakisanze, uh, Easy Afric Designs, she makes her designs from uh, the Mutuba tree. The Mutuba tree is found in six African countries, including Uganda. And the amazing thing about the tree is that you can harvest the, the bark of it. The, the, the, the fabric is also called bark cloth. You can harvest it every two years without affecting the life of the tree. So once you have two, two Mutuba trees in your garden, you have about eight feet square fabric every two years, and you can use it to make, um, they make lampshades, they make upholstery, they make fabric for clothing, they make handicrafts and a lot of stuff from it. The, the, once the bark is removed, as you can see from the previous slide, the tree is covered with uh, banana leaves to allow it to regrow. And the, it's scraped off, um, by skilled artisans, it's scraped off, and then through a method of pounding, it is expanded. So from a thin strip of about less than two feet, it grows to about eight feet square. Through the pounding, progressive pounding, the, the material expands and, the, and the, the workman using that mallet just continues pounding until he's got what he wants and in the correct um, quality. And then he, he folds it all up and steams it up. And then it's ready for use. And if you see the, the, the, the fabric there that he's holding, that after it has dried, it's, it's, it's steamed first and then it's dried and you can actually bleach it as well. And from it, they make those gift, gift packs. And I don't want you to imagine, I'm actually wearing a Mituba tree dress today. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you for this uh, valuable information. Uh, I want to start by giving a few figures, because uh, the title of this session is about the power of design in a global context. And one of the countries uh, promoting design heavily is the UK. Now, let me give you a few figures. The scale of design economy in the UK is 71.1 billion pounds. And the growth rate is 28%, which is faster than the UK growth. In other words, the design economy is one of the fastest growing economies in the UK. And the export figure is 34 billion pounds. So uh, you can imagine 
the power of design. Almost 600,000 people are working in this industry, which is 10% of the UK workforce. So you can see the power of design by just looking at these figures. Now, uh, it's obviously a new strategy of development for many countries. But we have interesting examples today from two different countries, from two different continents, actually. And I want to raise a few questions, and then we can continue to discuss. But let me tell you something. We love baobab tree in this country. How come? Baobab tree, known in Turkey? Well, Alexander, no, uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, the little prince, almost every child reads here in this country. And the baobab tree is our dream. We never seen, I never seen a baobab tree in my life, but I keep knowing it since my childhood. Now, my first question uh, is about the title of your company. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love the word uh, rhizome. It goes back to my, well, uh, years when I was studying philosophy a little bit. It reminds me of Guattari. Uh, and um, uh, Felix, uh, Felix Guattari. Uh, and that was a term uh, highly used at that time. So is this the reason you have this uh, yes, title as a name is, of it your... is the reason. Um, because a rhizome is actually um, a part of a plant which is not the root and it's not the shoot. But it's still something in between. Um, a rhizome is something that replicates itself but it's more like a map, it's not a tracing. So um, that's why as a design firm, I thought this was really important to be um, a decentralized unit between production and marketing, but actually neither of them. Something that keeps it together and something that can network to other experts, factions, societies, concerns. Right, so it's a kind of a proliferation of design ideas and design products, very mm -hmm. promising vocabulary. Very challenging as well, of course. Uh, well, bamboo, I like this material. You won't believe in this, but I have it in my garden. Uh -huh. And I was warned that it's a very dangerous uh, plant because it goes underneath and then, as you say, like rhizome, uh -huh. uh, even may explode the foundation of the house, they said. Uh, so far, nothing happened. I'm safe, don't worry. The house is in its place. Uh, but they're not growing faster. Uh -huh. and. Uh, and I can't use them for any construction. So my question is then about the geography of bamboo. Mm -hmm. well, it's a wonderful material, but probably the production of bamboo is limited with certain countries. No, because um, there are about 1,500 species of bamboo and mm -hmm. about 300 genera of bamboo, so we don't know which one you have. And everyone has a different wall thickness mm -hmm. and different uh, circumference and a different internodal length. So it is not limited. Every kind of bamboo has a different application. Some might be suited to a fishing pole, and some might be suited to a pillar. Right, so we need to know bamboo well. Yes, exactly. Well enough to kind and yes. their durability, strength, etc. But this is an interesting example because uh, bamboo here uh, has been used uh, as an experiment and also part of your uh, company's products. But I'm sure you apply the same system to the other products as well. What is next? Yes, we do. We work with a lot of mainstreams. Um, um, our last project was actually using the same philosophy for branding. Um, I showed about the sustainability certification system. Mm -hmm. That was developed for the government of Vietnam and uh, it is adopted as the UNIRO methodology now. And um, it is now expanding, like the rhizome, to other sectors like fisheries and um, export sectors. So that same certification system, the same software, is now being applied and being explored by the government. Right. So how many people are following you? How many disciples <laughs> do you have? I have no clue. <laughs> no idea. No idea. Right. Well, uh, there are architects uh, working with bamboo, actually, and they created wonderful uh, works in the last uh, few decades. Uh, Kengo Kuma is one of them. Uh, Shigeru Ben is another one. Uh, and they created uh, incredible spaces by using bamboo. Now we are creating more furniture and interiors. How do you see your work in relation to theirs? 
I think it's like saying if someone designed with uh, steel and with copper, what is the difference? Because to you it's just bamboo perhaps, you know, but mm -hmm. to me a metal works like that. So their bamboo is, for example, Moso is perfectly straight, perfectly regular and lends itself to a multiplication. It is the nature of that material that it should be counted and not measured. Uh, mm -hmm. My bamboo is different. It is the nature of my bamboo more to be measured than to be counted because it's not perfectly straight. It's not uh, equal. Mm. So um, for me, it's like talking about apples and oranges. It's totally different. It's like talking about a copper product or a stainless steel product. You mean architecture and interiors and products? No, just no. The, the bamboo and the bamboo. Not even the genre, mm. just the material itself. Material, different. Yes. So we can apply, we can use bamboo for different purposes. Mm -hmm. And you are interested in mostly small products and craft mm -hmm. ones. And the others are interested in the architecture. I'm actually right. interested in furniture because if I use one pole of bamboo to make a basket, mm -hmm. um, I can probably get X amount of money for it. But if I use it to make a chair, I can get 9X for it. So if I have to delegate my production resources or a community's resources for that, mm -hmm. I would definitely pick the one which gives me 9X. Right. Uh, so how do you see craft in relation to industry? Uh, craft, yes, uh, is a very valuable thing, mm -hmm. uh, but also we need industry uh, in certain circles especially. Uh, so I, I don't think that um, craft is different from industry. I think that before industrialization took place, people were very industrious. And uh, for example, in my country, we were exporting textiles to the rest of the world. So we yeah. achieved those volumes, we achieved those quality checks, obviously. Uh, we achieved that kind of packaging way back in the 15th century. So mm -hmm. I don't think craft is exclusive from uh, mass production. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in your country, you know it, any country who has craft as a way of life, craft is actually mass production. Craft is also a beautiful painting and patronage. Um, craft has so many things, just like industrialization is so many things. It's just a way of producing. It's just, you know, an alternative way. I don't see it as an antithesis to industrialization or um, a simile to industrialization. Okay, so we I, need to develop them both parallel I, I, to each other. I think other, that they're mutually exchangeable side. in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, the biggest compliment was when I had a German intern who told me that I can get a more precise thing with your craft than I can with the machine. Excellent. Because humans are better than machines. Mm -hmm at the end of the day? Well, uh, <laughs> hmm, arguably, say, uh, in, in certain things, I accept their power, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I can't uh, win with the chess game, with computer, for instance. Uh, computer is always better than me when I play chess. But Up your okay. skills. <laughs> <laughs> right. Laila, let's go back to your school. Yes. Uh, I'm sure it must be an enjoyable school. Uh, and all these departments you have, uh, Textile, interior, uh, design, a combination of different design uh, areas. Uh, how do they work? Uh, do they work together or separately? What are the relationship between different design disciplines within the boundaries of the school? Okay, um, the model that we use at, at, at our school is that two years the students have foundation years and all the students take all the subjects across the board. This includes photography, printing processes, free, a lot of freehand drawing, instrumental drawing, and all that is compulsory, the two foundation years. And at the end of the second year, therefore, they choose um, a specialization. And although in the third and fourth year they have a few um, courses that they take together, but now they, they begin to implement design differently. The process might be the same, they implement it differently. So first there's a kind of uh, an integration of different design disciplines. Yes. Uh, and then separation gradually towards uh, their own uh, field of specialism. Uh, so that's the structure. And you have many graduates, I guess, uh, since those years. Uh, what are they doing? Where are they employed? Yes, we have seen three. <laughs> Probably they were your <laughs> students, I guess. We have uh, the, the, our design school is the oldest. Oh, um, right. After it, there's been about six other universities of offering design. The graduates, they, some of them go into government. Mm -hmm. um, 
the, like our Ministry of Public Works, which employs a lot of interior designers. Some of them go into broadcasting. Uh, some of them go into publishing design. Mm. And then we have the product designers also. Some of them do their own thing with the craft people. And some of them are employed in the private mm -hmm. sector. Excellent. Yeah. Um, we have seen three designers uh, and excellent works, leather works. Uh, do you think uh, they export a lot or for the local consumption only? What is their position in relation to global economies? Presently, there is a lot of um, government intervention in trying to do value addition in Kenya because a lot of the leather was being exported raw. But now the government is saying to create more jobs, to get more money, let us encourage. So there's the introduction of the Leather Association of Kenya, and they're working closely with the government. And so they're doing a lot of research um, into leather, and then the production as well. Because when you produce like Beatrice Mwasi, she's supporting about 15 micro enterprises right. undertaking different parts of the production. Yeah. So it's going to be a big central organization in the long run. Hopefully. Of my uh, Hopefully. kind of a design research center as well. Yes. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, well, uh, now maybe uh, I should ask a question for both of you. Uh, what is the power of craft in relation to export? Uh, because uh, there are strong traditional uh, signs. For instance, I got a lovely uh, uh, case, uh, suitcase from Africa. Uh, the texture, as you said, is was there. And the pattern is so different than any of the, uh, the small cases that we have in Turkey. Immediately it uh, says that, look, I'm from a different continent. So that identity is important and I'm uh, proud of it, and I'm taking this to my classes. When I teach, I carry my computer within that. It's very beautiful. Now, but these are very rare examples. Uh, so are there, for instance, uh, governmental institutions uh, trying to promote local design globally? What is the relationship of local design and global consumption? What are the challenges? Uh, well, how about do you think about that? regarding you know, your uh, designs or your designs or your students' design? Uh. So for me, um, I think that that local touch is very important uh, because mm -hmm. when you go onto the export market, you're competing at a cost which is your cost in your nation into eight, looking at, I mean, just a rough rule of thumb mm -hmm. calculation. And you're sitting there next to China, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Right. who are producing the same category of industrial products or craft products or food products or anything. This is the time when your edge and your game is appearing different. It is, you know, making your product stand out. And good design is the way to make it stand out. Now, whether that is based on craft, it's based on costing, it's based on anything. But your product needs to stand out because it is somehow opening up its competition from one nation to all of the nations on that shelf. So right. in terms of that, um, I wouldn't say craft, but of course it's easier to market products that are exclusive or um, specifically renowned from the place of origin where the materials come from the same place. For example, um, it's so easy to market Indian textiles because India is known for textiles. Yes. So if <laughs> you are our rivals, you know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so if I have to market a pashmina cashmere from India right. and some lady in America was doing it and I was standing in an expo, of course the person would come to me. It's so easy for me, right, if I can deliver on time at that cost and things like that. So it is a tool to use. It's not about doing the right thing or the good thing or not at all the romantic thing. It's about what makes business sense. Innovation, yeah. novelty, yes. difference, yes. identity. Exactly. Great. These are great vocabularies, actually. And uh, would you like to add something to that, Mailak? Yeah. Um, for us, craft is very important because it gives the pillar for growth of design, especially in the African content as a whole. Because from the crafts is where we get our raw materials, we get our patterns, we get our uh, 
everything that goes into production of a product. And even if the product looks global, and it ha we therefore give it a local name or brand it in a local way, we are able to identify with it. So we, we, our ent entry into global market is through our products. And then the designer comes in to look at commercialization, the technologies, the techniques, and all that so to make it more commercially viable. It's a big challenge for us because the, the craft producers uh, who, who have, there's a lot of demand like even from the United States. And when we cannot commercialize those, the production or semi-commercialize the production, then we cannot standardize the products too well. So that, that's, that's a, a challenge for us. All right, okay. Uh, we have 10 minutes, uh, so I assume there may be some questions. Uh, and turning to the audience and try to see whether there is any. If not, I will continue to ask my questions. There is one. <coughs> yes, it's over there. Could you please uh, help her? Thank you. Um, my question is regarding um, Ms. Rebecca's uh, presentation. You talked about uh, cultural sustainability as well as resources and everything. And then in the end of your presentation, you talked about globalization. So I was wondering, uh, in that context, how do you see that relation? Because in, um, I don't know, Turkey, in the beginning of the uh, presentation, uh, it was mentioned that we're always looking to the West and never to the East. Or, uh, anyways. Or um, South. Or South, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> English problems. Um, so th that's because in, with globalization, I mean, I see it as a Western nation in a sense. How do you see, uh, is it possible to go on with cultural sustainability or is it another uh, challenge? Um, I think everything in design is a challenge, but every challenge is also an opportunity. Um, in terms of cultural sustainability, I think that it is always um, us who are looking towards the developed world and thinking that, you know, we should be like them. But we don't realize that McDonald comes to China and serves rice with the burgers. I'm sure it, I haven't gone to McDonald's in Turkey, but I'm sure it does something <laughs> Turkish <laughs> with the burgers. So it comes to India and it makes vegetarian burgers. So I mean, as much as you are watching them, they are watching you. You are watching them to be like you. They are watching you to take your money. Why don't you take your own money? I mean, you don't even have to do that whole loop around. You are the emerging market. I mean, you're one of the 10 most emerging markets as is India. So should I go to the States, get a designer from XYZ place and develop a product, or just find out what my people need, package it in the way that they want, and sell it to them. So in terms of cultural sustainability, it's not about focusing on craft or something like that. For me, it's on focusing on relevant traditions. Relevant traditions are like food. No matter where you go, the food does not get globalized for a really long time. And when the food does get globalized, like for example, I studied in Holland and it took me around six months to find out that there were three authentic Dutch things. And when I came back and told my mom, she's like, only three? How? And then I talked to my friends and they had lost their food, you know? And it's, it's irrecoverable. So now in the age of the creative economy, like in places like the UK and other places, where they're looking at the creative economy to bring in the big bucks, you have something, I have something, and they don't. Mm. So it's not about sustaining culture for um, preserving it or for heritage or something. It's drawing on culture because it's a really important resource and you have it. Right, good. Any other uh, questions? I don't. Is there any? I'm sorry, because of the lights, I oh, can't there. see here. It's here, here. It's okay. Ben Tevfik Hocam çeviri yapacağı inancıyla Türkçe soracağım sorumu. Ee, siz Türkiye'yi tasarım noktasında nerede görüyorsunuz? Buraya gelmeden önce bir inceleme yaptınız mı? Ya da şu anki etkinlikteki e, ön izlenimleriniz nedir? 
Ve genel olarak son dönemde butik tasarım, organik tasarım, el yapımı işler daha ön planda. Son dönem böyle bir şeyin gelişmesi sizi ne ölçüde değiştirdi ve sizi bu alanda bir e, motivasyona e, sebep oldu mu? Bunu sormak istiyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Do you translate it? You'll have to translate for me. No, okay. Well, she's asking uh, a few questions, actually, not only one. Uh, she says that, have you done any research about Turkish design before mm -hmm. you come here? Uh, or what are your uh, prior uh, observations about uh, Turkish design? In this case, we are talking about uh, sustainable design, organic designs. Do you see their evidences uh, in Turkey? And what's your impression of Turkish design overall? Mm -hmm. So, um, I did try to study and research on Turkish design before I came here, but I didn't find um, a lot of examples on the internet, so either um, people are doing things in other places or they're not highlighting what they're doing here on the global search engine so that they jump up, which is something that every designer should look at. You know, you, sh you need to jump up on the international searches if you want to remain current. Um, the second experience of Turkish design is the first thing I do when I have the opportunity in any country is go to the biggest market and look at what they're selling and what they're buying. So I walked around the Turkish markets to see what they're selling and what they're buying. And just like India, it's a wide range of products from really craft things, which I saw in the um, Grand Bazaar, to really contemporary, um, you know, Western, modern, um, Vitra kind of products. But it was amazing to me, like when I went to the Grand Bazaar, um, actually we went together, I saw this rosary beads, which you have in Turkey, which is made in Anatolia, which is actually um, a spring of metal wrapped around a silk thread, which is then made into Chinese beads and their rosary. And I was just thinking, what if you just enlarge this gigantic thing and make a gigantic upholstered furniture? It would be so amazing, you know? You must come to Istanbul <laughs> to do this design. You so, see, you've got ideas already. Yeah, so there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of things from Turkey which I find charming. Um, like there's this restaurant called uh, The Bosphorus where we go for uh, our lunch. And it has these things, these uh, shapes of lightings, which are somehow remind me of Turkish lights and Turkish tea glasses, but they're very contemporary. And the arrangement of the um, interior architecture is very contemporary. So it's such a strong feeling of Turkey, even in contemporary objects. So I think it's just like in India, it's really easy to be contemporary Indian. I think it's really easy to be contemporary Turkish if you just uh, have your hand on the pulse of craft and the market at the same time. Right. Thank you. Good impression. The last question, and then I have three minutes to complete the session. Is there any burning question? There's a gentleman there. There's, okay, yes, thank you. The last question. Merhaba. Benim sorum şöyle olacak. Thank you. Zanaatkar yüksek becerili insanların, sizin yaptığınız Rebecca Hanım için özellikle soruyorum. Yine diğer... Sayın Katılımcı'nın da cevap vermesini isteyeceğim. Ee, çalışmalarınızdan önceki kazançlarındaki değişim, elde ettikleri kazançlarındaki değişim yüzde olarak ne kadar oldu? Ee, bir de e, yüksek becerili insanların e, son e, ürünün son satışından elde ettikleri gelirleri, burada bir parantez içinde, ürünü tamamen bir kişinin elinden çıktığını düşünerek yani katma değer olarak sırf bir kişinin çıkarttığını düşünerek kazançları ne kadar fark edebildi oran olarak teşekkürler. Oh yeah so um, this is the best thing about my job is that um, I get to see families grow and I get to see people making money. In terms of percentages, maybe about 30% um, um, of the total product value goes to the community, but that's our choice. You don't technically have to give 30% to production or producers. Um, as a sustainable firm, that's a stand we've taken. Um, 
in terms of how much money do they earn, before we started working with these people, um, a lot of them didn't have houses. They lived in uh, just rough houses which were not made of bricks, you know, like a normal house. Um, the other day, some of my craftspeople sent me photographs. Apparently, all the boys have bought bikes for themselves and they're taking their girlfriends all over town. So I think that uh, this is a good indication of how much money they're earning. Um, in my firm, uh, the three main craftspeople earn more than all of the designers, than each designer. And they earn more not because it's a handout, they earn more because they're worth it, because my craftspeople um, can do AutoCAD, they can do costing, and they can make it as well. So, uh, you know, it's just like, um, if they had the fortune of been being in my house, being born in my house, probably they wouldn't even employ me to be the drafts person. I mean, I keep telling that because they have so much of brains. So um, if you actually capacity build them and teach them things, uh, one of my crafts person just went to Ghana and took a workshop a few years ago alone. He actually taught designers how to work with bamboo. So if you actually capacity build them, they can earn um, much more than um, probably even I earn. In fact, probably they do earn much more than I earn because I don't earn much. Okay. Uh, hi, <coughs> uh, I would like to uh, thank our uh, speakers uh, and also our audience for these uh, lovely questions and listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Fotoğraf çekimi için öne rica edelim sizi. Harika bir paneldi. Ağzınıza sağlık hocam ve değerli misafirlerimiz. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Kısacık bir ara veriyoruz. Sonrasında ödül törenimizle devam edeceğiz. Sağ olun hocam. Çok teşekkürler. Ödül törenimize bekliyoruz sizleri saat 5'te.